Welcome everyone to another seminar of mathematics and high energy physics at Physics Latin. Today we are pleased to have Professor Suni Mukid with us. Professor Mukid did his PhD at Stony Brook in quantum field theory and supersymmetry. Then he held a postdoctoral position at the International Center for Theoretical Physics, ICTP, and was a faculty member at the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research in Mumbai for 27 years. Then he joined the Institute, the Indian Institute of Science and Education and Research, PUNE, and ICTS Bangladesh. His research focused mostly on quantum field theory, gravitational black holes, string theory, quantum entanglement, and so many other areas of physics. His most recent focus areas are classification of rational conformal field theories using mathematics of modular forms, the study of quantum gravity, partition functions, uh, the computation of entanglement entropy in the context of ADS-CFT, and so many more areas. He has uh, done fundamental work in topological string theory, uh, uh, particular applications to matrix model, and so many more. Uh, again, we are happy to have uh, Professor Muki with us, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much, Daniel. So uh, I will start now and let me say right away that uh, I'm very happy to have as much interaction as you like. I think we have been given two hours. So I plan the talk itself should be shorter, much shorter than that. Maybe an hour and 15 minutes, maybe an hour even. So if you interrupt, it will be very welcome and I'll be able to explain things uh, better. Uh, also, I want to uh, show you the list of content. So there are basically six sections. And the first three are very, very introductory. And the last three numbers, sections four, five, and six, will be a little uh, advanced and algebraic. And I'll try to go through them a little more slowly. And uh, probably it will not be very uh, easy to grasp everything in those sections. But I hope you'll get some information which you can follow up later. So let's start at the very beginning with the concept of scaling. Uh, this concept is fundamental in physics, uh, and as a simple example, uh, look at Newton's law of gravitation. So if I take a distance r and I scale it by some number lambda, then the force scales like lambda to the minus 2, that is in an inverse square law. So it's very simple, and it has a simple scaling behavior. And we also sort of understand the reason for this. Uh, it's a constant flux distributed over larger spheres, and so it falls off like this. But that's a classical law, and in statistical or quantum physics, it's much more difficult to understand scaling, the scaling behavior of laws. And the reason is that in these theories, we have to perform a path integral, which sums over many, many configurations. And... Now, to extract the scaling behavior, we need to solve this system either exactly or we should find the dominant configurations or saddle points in every region of parameter space and then find the scaling behavior for that uh, for the, the, those values of parameters. So some extra work has to be done to understand scaling. Now, uh, where did this concept start? Well, it started to some extent with Lars Onsager who got a chemistry Nobel Prize in 1968. He was a brilliant mathematical chemist. Uh, in, uh, you might find it interesting that he was also a very bad teacher and he was fired from his job at Johns Hopkins after one semester for poor teaching. But he went on to do brilliant work and win a Nobel Prize and that's a picture of him. And what was his main contribution? Well, it was the exact solution of the easing model in two dimensions. And uh, there was a series of papers, some of which were with Kaufman. And in that paper that I've shown here in 49, they computed the spin-spin correlation function in the 2D easing model exactly. And uh, it's a special, it's given in terms of some gamma functions and so on. But what you can do is to go to the critical temperature where the phase transition takes place from a disorder to an ordered phase. And there, if you actually use their formula and do a little calculation, you'll find that the spin-spin correlation function for a spin 
for two spins separated by k units of distance goes like one over k to the one fourth. And here is the scaling. So it's um, similar to inverse square law, if you like, except that it's inverse one fourth power of separation. So here's an example of scaling. And uh, from these early solutions, the theory developed quite rapidly. One little comment is that in principle, the easing model is a lattice theory, but once we have scaling, then we can take a limit called the continuum limit, making the lattice finer and finer. And that's uh, the system that we can study using the techniques of quantum field theory. So many years later, actually, it's a very big gap between 49 and 66 or so, uh, Kadanoff uh, discussed local operators in this, this type of system, the continuum limit of a critical system. Uh, this was his paper in 1969. And his uh, basic approach was to show that operators like the spin operator have power law correlations just like the example I gave, but in generality. So in quite general systems, uh, there are power law co correlations governed by critical exponents. Each observable, according to him, in a critical system has a definite scale dimension, delta. And as an example, in his work, he argued that the easing model in two dimensions at criticality has a very small number of basic scaling operators whose scaling dimensions are as follows. The spin operator has dimension one by eight, the energy operator has dimension one, and the stress tensor has dimension two. These are interesting numbers. They look very simple, but uh, he, gave the, he gave arguments for them. And just to show you, the first one, delta sigma equals one eighth, is exactly why this law is what it is. So this sigma sigma correlator is one over distance to the one fourth, where one eighth comes from the first sigma and one eighth comes from the second sigma. That's why we get one fourth. So in some sense, his abstract, more abstract approach and also more general approach uh, predicts that uh, fall off of the correlation function. He also worked out more general features, including the fact that two operators, when I take them close to each other, uh, factorize onto all local operators of the theory with some coefficient c i j k called structure constants and some singular powers, which again reflect the scaling of the theory. Now, it wasn't only Kadanoff, there were also similar and related ideas in many other systems. And uh, some of these, these names uh, are, are well known for their contributions in the field, and probably there were many more. But then in 1971, Ken Wilson kind of uh, put the finishing touch on the system by proposing that we should think of such uh, the, of scaling as a consequence of the renormalization group. Now, this will not be very directly relevant to my talk, but it's just to say that this is like the deepest explanation of scaling, and it 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 is connected to a whole theory of the of RG or renormalization group for which Wilson deservedly got the Nobel Prize in physics all by himself, which is pretty rare. So he explained that quantum or statistical systems are scale dependent and his results applied both to particle physics and statistical physics. So it's a very, very impactful work. And his point was that as we vary the energy at which we work, the parameters of a model, of a quantum or statistical model, effectively flow until they reach a fixed point. And once they reach a fixed point, the system has become scale invariant, which means it really doesn't flow anymore because there's no preferred energy scale. So now once you are at the fixed point, changing the energy scale doesn't really change anything in the theory. Okay, now that's just scale invariance. But it has been shown since then that under quite general conditions, scale invariance implies a stronger symmetry uh, of what is called conformal transformations or conformal invariance. And it is the set of all reparameterizations or change of coordinates such that the uh, angle between any two vectors is preserved. So if V1 and V2 are two vectors, then the quantity on the left is cos theta, cos of the angle between them. 
on the right it's cos of the angle in some other coordinate system and this change of coordinates x to x prime preserves the angle uh, and that's what is called conformal so here's a picture of it you see that i can deform the the square grid into something not at all square but in such a way that all uh, lines intersect still at 90 degrees so this is an example of how angles are preserved and that's what conformal transformations are scale transformations are a special case of that also translations rotations all are special cases but there are more things and together they form a group called the conformal group and any quantum field theory which has conformal invariance is called a conformal field theory so this is the context of what i'll be discussing now and therefore combining this with the wilson idea of having a renormalization group flow with energy and the fact that the flow ends at fixed points uh, we learn that conformal field theory describes end points of this flow and since many systems flow to common fixed points so they can flow from many directions all converging to common fixed points it ends up being that these fixed point theories describe universal properties of many different systems and this property of universality is very deep and very influential in statistical physics now <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I've said this already. So statistical systems at critical points, but also particle physics theories at high or low energy must be CFTs. Now, what do we gain by noticing that these systems are CFTs? Well, conformal invariance turns out to be a very powerful symmetry, and it's especially powerful in two dimensions, as I'll argue. And this places very strong constraints on what these systems can do, as a result of which many conformal field theories are exactly solvable and others are partially solvable. And this is what we'll be discussing to some extent today. The best understood examples of CFTs are those in two dimensions. Uh, two dimensions can be either one plus one, that means there's one space dimension and there's time, and it's a quantum theory, or it can be two space dimensions and now it's a statistical system and you can if you are clever enough continue uh, the behavior between the one plus one d and the two d case so you can apply the results of cft both to a lorentzian quantum field theory and to a euclidean statistical field theory okay and I'll conclude this section and then ask for questions if there are any by listing many of some of the diverse motivations to study 2D QFT and practice CFT in practice. So one we've already talked about is critical systems in statistical physics. But there's another one which really was very appealing to some of us who are really particle physicists like myself in the 1980s because conformal field theories also describe the world sheet of relativistic strings. So that's a completely different application. And in that application, a string, which is a one dimensional extended object, sweeps out a sheet. And you can argue that on that sheet, the variables that live on it, basically the coordinates of the string, behave like fields in a 2D conformal field theory. Now, uh, you can also uh, use uh, 2D CFT in uh, regular as well as stringy versions of ADS3 CFT2 duality. Uh, I shouldn't have said quantum or stringy here because it can be, but it doesn't have to be. So there are two kinds of 2D CFT, as we'll see. Uh, there's the irrational kind, which I'm not going to discuss, and because nobody knows how to classify them, and there are the rational kind. So the rational kind, which I will talk about in the rest of this talk, uh, give rise to quantum or stringy versions of holography. Uh, they are also relevant to the study of anions and the fractional quantum Hall effect. So that's a different application in statistical physics and to a proposed subject called topological quantum computing. Now, that's a short list of the physics motivations, but mathematicians also study this subject and their names for this subject are vertex operator algebras, related topic called modular tensor categories, 
and another related topic called vector valued modular forms. And then there's a very special um, corner of mathematics which studies what are called moonshine modules for sporadic groups. And uh, this is done by people who are interested in finite groups and their representations. And it turns out that conformal field theory provides ways to generate the dimensions of representations of very special finite groups called sporadic groups. So that's a lot of motivations. And uh, it's very nice because it's one unified uh, formalism and one unified theory, but it has all these potential applications. OK, so with that, I'm happy to pause if there are any questions or comments. Yeah, someone raised their hand. Please unmute yourself and ask. Sir, I want to ask, is it a conformal field theory implies local gauge theory? Uh, implies local? Gauge invariance? No, there's no need for a conformal field theory to have any kind of gauge invariance. So given the solution, solution suppose in a, in a field theory, I have given a, a suppose wave function. How will I know the theory is conformal invariance? How will I know the angle is still preserved? You will know angles are preserved from the fact that when you solve the theory, correlation functions show the symmetry of conformal invariance. So that symmetry, conformal invariance, imposes certain constraints on the correlation functions and also on the partition function. So if these solutions satisfy those constraints, then, and if there is a QFT behind it, then uh, it's a CFT. Hmm. Yeah, I got it. Any other questions? Please feel free to ask, and uh, it will really help me because I'll un I'll real I'll understand how much you uh, are following or how much you what you would like to know. Hmm? Okay, if there are no questions at this stage, I will move on. So my next topic is, so this was about what is conformal invariance and the historical background. But now let's get into a few details. So in two dimensions, the conformal transformations uh, form two infinite sets. This is quite striking because normally symmetries in QFT are finite dimensional, but here they are infinite dimensional and moreover, they are doubly infinite. And the way we see that, is that there are certain symmetry generators ln, where n takes values over all positive and negative integers. And then ln with lm obeys a commutator algebra, which I've written over here. Now, the first term on the right side just says that L with L gives another L. And you see that there's also some kind of additive property of these indices. Uh, but the second term is rather interesting. It has no operator, it just has a number C in front of it. And uh, it only arises if M is equal to minus N because that's the only time this delta function is one, otherwise it's zero. So this is the Virasoro algebra and it's infinite dimensional because N takes infinitely many values. And there's another Virasoro algebra for L bar. So that's the second infinite set and the L's and L bars just commute with each other. Now, um, each conformal field theory, therefore, has these two Virasoro algebras. The C, for my purposes, the C, the same, this number, will be the same for the L's and the L bars. And uh, it's called the central charge. So it's a real number. It's also supposed to be positive for unitary theories. And it's a very interesting number because it's a generalized measure of the degrees of freedom. Now, you shouldn't take that too literally, but in simple conformal field theories where we know how to count degrees of freedom, for example, free bosons or free fermions, then C is proportional to the number of free bosons or number of free fermions. So that's what I mean by this statement. Okay, now some examples of C and of conformal field theories that we know are the easing model, which happens to have C equals half, the tricritical easing model, which has C equals 7 over 10, and the three-state spots model, which has central charge 4 over 5. Now, all these numbers are less than 1, but in practice, C can take any value from 0 to infinity. 
or it can take values from zero to infinity. And it's not yet known whether it can take all values or it's only restricted to some values. Moreover, for a given C, it doesn't mean we have a unique theory. In these three cases, it more or less means that. So actually at C equals half, the easing model is unique. At 7 tenth, tricritical is unique. But at 4 fifth, there are actually two CFTs, one of which is the POTS model. So sometimes there can be more than one CFT for a given value of C. And then uh, it's known that there are no unitary CFTs with central charge, for example, between half and seven tenth. So there are values of C for which there is no unitary CFT. Okay, so this is very important. This symmetry plays a very fundamental role in all discussions of 2D CFT. But often, uh, like any other QFT, CFTs can also have continuous internal symmetries. Now in physics, Continuous internal symmetries are classified by compact Lie algebras. And the possible compact Lie algebras were classified by Cartan long ago. And they are the following. They are the AN, BN, CN, and DN, all of which have some familiar names, which you see on the right-hand side, unitary, orthogonal, symplectic. And then there's a small list of what are called exceptional Lie algebras, which are only five of them with fixed rank. So the superscript, sorry, not superscript, the subscript is the rank of the algebra. So this is the case for uh, ordinary field theories. For example, Yang-Mills theory can have any of these as its gauge group, or a scalar field theory uh, can have any of these as its uh, symmetry of its potential. But uh, in 2D CFT, something happens to this these symmetries get actually enhanced again to be infinite dimensional. And the technical name for the algebra that they form is a katz moody algebra. And uh, its generators uh, look sort of similar to LN, the Virasoro generators, but they have an extra index A, which runs over the dimension of the algebra. So it has an index N, which runs over all integers, negative and positive, as well as A, which runs over the dimensions of an algebra. And the commutator of JNA with JMB, the first term on the right makes it look very much like a Lie algebra, except that JC comes with index N plus M. So again, the additive property of this index. And moreover, here also, there's a central term. So there's a number K appearing in the second term, which is called the level of the katz moody algebra. Notice that if n and m are equal to zero, then the last term disappears because it has a factor n in it and all the j's become j0. And that's in fact the uh, ordinary Lie algebra G, which sits as a subalgebra of the katz moody algebra. So it's a very beautiful structure. We haven't said anything about representations of these algebras. Right now, I'm just telling you about the algebras. Later, we'll talk a little about their representations. Now, once we have a katz moody algebra, we can write a conformal field theory that's based entirely on it, by which I mean that its symmetry algebra is completely determined by the katz moody algebra. In fact, in such theories, which are called west sumino witten theories, even the conformal symmetries, the Virasoro generators, are not independent, but they are composites of the J's. So they are bilinear in the J's. So uh, if I have a katz moody symmetry, I can take bilinears and I can show that these bilinears with this normalization uh, satisfy the Virasoro algebra for some fixed central charge, which we'll discuss. Okay. So we've talked about LNs and JNAs. These are possible symmetries of 2D conformal field theory. Now, physicists like to think of these as being the modes of fields. So both of these are mode expansions uh, of fields T of Z and JA of Z. And the fields are analytic, which means that on the plane, they depend only on Z and not on Z bar. This makes them automatically conserved currents because the conservation equation turns into del bar of t equals zero and del of t bar equals zero, which are guaranteed by the analytic or anti-analytic form of t and t bar. 
So T is made out of LNs and T bar would be made out of LN bars, similarly for J and J bar. But in fact, the it, it, it's easy to find out what from the algebra, what is the conformal dimension of T and J. And it turns out that the conformal dimension of T is two, which is also its spin. If you remember in my very early transparency, Kardanov had already predicted that T has dimension two. So this spin is an evidence of that prediction and currents have spin one. So these are two interesting conserved currents that a CFT can have. And if I give you the conserved currents, then automatically by mode expansion, you can get all the symmetry generators. But these are not everything. A general 2D CFT can also have conserved currents of any other spin. So for example, you can have spins three, four, five, six, anything. Okay, but it has to be an integer. In a footnote, I've pointed out that the spins could be half integer as well, but in this talk, I won't be considering them. So everything I'm saying has a generalization to the half integer or fermionic or super conformal CFT case. Now we'll give a name, a calligraphic V uh, to the totality of all conserved currents of any given 2D CFT. So if the CFT has some stress tensor T and some uh, Katz-Moody currents J and some other currents W, then the collection of all of them uh, will be called the chi. And the full symmetry algebra varies from one CFT to another in a very interesting way. Uh, but what we know for sure is that the stress tensor must always be there because uh, this is T, because its modes are the Virasoro generators and the Virasoro generators generate conformal symmetry. So obviously in a conformal field theory, you must have conformal symmetry and optionally you can have other symmetries. So that's the general structure of symmetries possible in a CFT. Now, what's the benefit of having such a big symmetry algebra? Well, it allows us to classify the states of the theory as being of two kinds, primary and secondary. And the physical intuition is that the primary states are basic and the secondary ones are derived using symmetry. So the secondary ones are generated from primaries using any of these symmetries that I've listed for you. For example, in a theory which has only Virasoro and Katz-Moody symmetry, we would define primary states by saying that all positive modes of the generators annihilate the state called phi. <clears throat> and now from the algebra, you can see that the negative modes, L minus N, J minus N, and so on, will in general not annihilate this primary phi, but will create new states which are called secondaries. So we can think of phi as some kind of analogous ground states and the secondaries as analogs of excited states. So what I've shown you in this picture is uh, in the first column, the lowest state is called zero. That's the vacuum of the full theory. And then you have an excited state J minus one A over it or L minus two, or you can have repeated applications of J's and L's and you get a lot of descendants all the way up to infinity. But there's another tower, and there can be in, in general many. This second tower is above not the vacuum, but above a specific primary phi, which is a non-trivial primary. Above this primary, you again have first level, second level, third level descendants. The interesting thing is that all the descendants are spaced in integers above the primary because they come from integer spin conserved currents. However, the primaries are not spaced in some regular way with respect to each other. I hope you can see in my diagram that phi is slightly higher than zero. And that difference in conformal dimension, which is the dimension of phi, can be some fraction. It need not be an integer. And generally, it's not an integer. So let's talk a little about this conformal dimension. So there's an operator L0, the zero mode of the Virasoro algebra. And whenever it acts on a primary, it will return an eigenvalue H, which we call the left conformal dimension. 
dimension and when L0 bar acts, we get the right conformal dimension and Kadanoff's delta was the sum of H and H bar. So that's the uh, structure of dimensions. And what you need to keep in mind is that H and H bar can be fractional. In fact, H plus H bar is delta. And as you saw, Kadanoff already had a prediction that delta is one eighth for um, the easing model for the spin field. If you can excuse me, I just need a glass of water. I'll be back. You can start. Okay. Now, uh, once we've got all these definitions of primaries and secondaries, uh, we should ask, what do we want to calculate? And in any QFT, one of the most important things to calculate is a correlation function of several fields. So an example of a correlation function we may want to study in any QFT would be the correlation functions of four copies of some field phi. Now, that's something that we know how to compute in many theories using perturbation theory and so on. But in 2D CFT, this quantity has a very special property which is that it can be broken up as a sum over the mod squared of a holomorphic or analytic object. This analytic object, uh, if you see inside the argument of the mod sign, is a set of four phi's that only depend on z and not z bar. That shows that it's analytic. And the subscript i tells us which conformal block it is. And there's a very beautiful structure of how you get conformal blocks using fusion, which I don't have time to go into. The important thing is that this is the structure of correlation functions in every 2D CFT. And that's a very useful fact. Now there's a price you pay for expressing correlation functions in terms of holomorphic conformal blocks. The blocks actually turn out not to have crossing symmetry or they are not single value. So this equation shows that if I have phi i at z1 and phi j at z2, and I switch them, which means I take the point z2, let's say, and move it around uh, z1 to the other side, I don't get back just the conformal block uh, with that exchange, but I get a linear combination with the matrix bij in front. So the ith block is a linear combination with matrix bij of the jth blocks. So that's all the blocks. And this braiding matrix, as it's called, that's why we call it B, depends on the conformal dimensions. And you see that because H's can be fractional, as we said earlier, so these exponentials are not trivial. They're not just the identity. And so this braiding is a multi-valuedness of the conformal block. So the blocks are analytic, but multi-valued. On the other hand, the correlators are single-valued, but they're not analytic. This is a very important fact. Let me show it to you again here. Look at the last equation. The right-hand side, uh, the term inside the mod sign is multi-valued, but analytic. But once I take the mod squared and sum, then I get the left side, which on the other hand is not analytic because clearly it depends on the Zs and Z bars, but it is single valued. So in, on the left side, if I interchange Z2 and Z3, nothing happens. So that is crossing symmetry. Okay, so I hope uh, I've sort of stated, though I haven't really proved or explained in detail, that would take a whole course, uh, how um, conformal invariance governs the kind of structure of correlation functions. And we'll see another par a parallel of that very soon in a different context. So the next thing to discuss is the partition function. So in any quantum or statistical system, I can always compute trace of e to the minus beta h and call that z of beta and say, well, this is the partition function. The physical meaning is that uh, it counts the degeneracy dn of every state of energy en. And in the picture I drew for you of primaries and descendants, it basically counts the number of primaries and the number of descendants um, in, and combines them into a generating function. But 2D CFT has special complex analytic properties 
And so Z no longer remains a function just of beta, the inverse temperature, but is generalized to a function of tau and tau bar, where tau is I beta plus some theta over two pi. This is in the last line. And L0 uh, and L0 bar are the Virasoro generators uh, and, the, and the analytic and the anti-analytic Virasoro generators. And there's a constant shift by the central charge over 24, which endows this Z with some very beautiful properties. So you should think that L plus L, L0 plus L0 bar minus C by 12, that's the Hamiltonian that's playing the role of H in the first line. And the imaginary part of tau is playing the role of beta. And so this generalized partition function is tracy to the minus beta H with some other insertion of something like a chemical potential. And we needn't go into the details. The important thing is that it is this complexified one, which has very beautiful mathematical properties. Uh, and I'm going to state those properties right away. So the property that this Z enjoys is that um, under a certain operation, which is trivial in the path integral representation, but not trivial in the operator representation, we find a relation between the partition function at a in temperature inverse beta and partition function at a temperature beta. So beta going to one by beta effectively. So let's see how that works. So we have this formalism. Uh, where Z is trace of Q to the L0 minus C by 24 times a complex conjugate. And if we ask how this trace can be evaluated using a path integral, which I assume you're familiar with, uh, then it turns out to be a path integral on a torus like this, where tau is a complex number that gives us the definition of the torus. Okay, assuming that the one axis of the torus is the unit vector, the other one is tau. Now this torus, has global symmetries given by a group PSL2Z where tau goes to A tau plus B over C tau plus D. And A, B, C, D uh, is a matrix of determinant one made up of integers and therefore forms the group SL2Z. These are called module, this is called the modular group and these are called modular transformations. And what you can show is that as far as the, from the perspective of a conformal field theory, a modular transformation takes a torus and gives me back the same torus. So it has, so the partition function necessarily must be invariant under this transformation. Since SL2Z is an infinite group, that's a lot of constraints on possible partition functions. And the constraints are embodied by saying that Z of gamma tau and gamma tau bar, where gamma, is, gamma tau is defined in the previous line, is equal to Z of tau and tau bar for every gamma in SL2Z. As I said, there are infinitely many gammas in SL2Z. So it's a lot of constraints on what possible partition function we can have. And this is an example of how conformal invariance strongly constrains a possible CFTs. Now, there's a nice way to understand this partition function, starting from its definition, which you see here in the middle of the slide, because note that this is a trace over all states of the system. But what are all states of the system? All states of the system were pictorially represented here. So they are the primaries and their descendants times the anti-holomorphic descendants. So I've only shown you the descendants by J's and L's. There are also descendants under J bars and L bars. For every primary, there's one tower of L and J descendants and an independent tower of L bar and J bar descendants. So it's convenient to think of a particular tower and calculate this quantity in that tower. So now this is for a fixed tower. That's why it says trace subscript I. And I've only taken Q to the L0 minus C by 24 without any Q bar, without any L0 bar factor. So this chi depends only on tau, but there's one for every primary in the theory. That's very important. Okay. Now in terms of these chi's, what is the partition function? Well, we'll come to that. First, what do these chi's look like? Well, at the bottom of the tower is a primary. 
and then I have descendants. And the descendants all have L0 values, which are integrally spaced with respect to the primary dimension. So chi has the following form. It's q to the minus c by 24, just copied from the top line. Then there's an hi, that's the conformal dimension of the primary. Okay. Then the first term is the degeneracy of that primary. It might have some multiplicity. It might be in some representation of a group. So there's some integer for that. The next term is another integer times q. Now q means that h has been augmented by one unit because q is e to the 2 pi i tau. So, and this is e to the 2 pi i tau h. So it's like this second term has e to the 2 pi i tau, uh, 2 pi i tau times h plus 1. Okay. And that means I'm counting the first level descendants of the primary, as I showed you in the picture. Similarly, a i comma 2 counts the second level descendants of the primary and so on all the way to infinity. So you see that the character is a counting function to count the number of descendants of any primary, including the degeneracy of the primary itself. Okay, And it's analytic in tau. This is very important. Now, how do I get the partition function out of this? Well, I told you that the uh, descendants of any given primary under L's and J's or under L bars and J bars are independent. So I need to multiply chi of tau by chi bar of tau bar and then combine all the left and right, as they are called, or holomorphic, anti-holomorphic uh, terms through a matrix Mij bar, which can, for many practical purposes, you can just think of delta Ij bar. So I just multiply the descendants, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic descendants, and then I sum over all the primaries and I get the partition function. Okay. Now, I don't know if this reminds you of anything, but it's supposed to be very similar to how correlation functions were built up. If you remember, they were built up as sums of mod squares of blocks, conformal blocks. Similarly, the partition function is built up as the mod square of a character, summed over all characters. Now, just as the conformal blocks were multi-valued under braiding, the um, Characters also have um, a multi-valuedness under modular transformations. Although they are analytic in tau, they don't actually each one go into itself under a modular transformation, but rather each character goes into a linear combination of all characters uh, with a matrix rho ij. And once uh, we find this matrix, uh, if this matrix has the property that rho dagger m rho is m, then uh, this z will obviously be invariant under modular transformations, which is the physics requirement. So we conclude that characters are analytic, but not modular invariant. Rather, they transform into linear combinations. But partition functions are modular invariant, though they are not analytic, because they depend on both tau and tau bar. So you see how very beautifully the properties of the partition function as function of tau and the properties of correlation functions as functions of locations in 2D uh, are parallel to each other. In both cases, there's a physical quantity that's the correlation function of the partition function that's completely invariant under anything you might do, uh, which leaves the system unchanged. But it's expressible in terms of some analytic quantities which themselves are not invariant, they're actually multi-valued. You can think of this transformation law for characters as a type of multi-valuedness. Okay, so I can pause again for questions. I think I'm doing fine with time, so let me pause for questions. Maybe you can mention why you want the system to have a modular invariance, because it's not something that you also want in other uh... Or well, the people is familiar from other systems in physics, so I think it's good. To uh, this is mention. true. Modular invariance is quite a special feature in conformal field theory. So uh, it's difficult to actually illustrate in detail, but I'm happy to say a few words about it. So uh, what happens is that uh, the partition function, this, it, it's basically embodied by the statement that the partition function, which is in the middle of this slide, 
is the same as a Euclidean path integral computed on the torus. Now, what is familiar to people is that any finite temperature partition function of a quantum field theory is computed by doing a path integral on Euclidean time, which is periodic with a period one by temperature, which is called beta. Okay. And remember that the imaginary part of tau is beta over here. So this vertical distance of the torus, the height of the torus is actually beta. So we've done the same prescription that we do for any quantum field theory, which is to argue that when I want to compute the thermal partition function, I must evaluate the Euclidean path integral on a periodic time. But here what I've done is also taken the space to be periodic from the beginning. So CFTs are normally thought of as living on a cylinder where the circle is the space and the vertical direction is time. And what I've done here is to take this time and make it uh, Euclidean, make it finite, and then make it periodic. So in that sense, it's not that different from something we do in other QFTs. However, because it's this is a torus and not simply a periodic circle, uh, and because uh, the torus has an infinite group of diffeomorphisms or symmetries, those are symmetries that a conformal field theory doesn't see. So what's actually happening when I perform an SL to Z transformation like this on the torus is that it may change its overall size or orientation, but conformal symmetry means we don't know the difference between a space oriented this way or this way, and we don't know the difference between a space that looks larger or smaller. Uh, that's all built into conformal invariance. So we can simply ask a mathematician, what are all the operations I can perform on tau, which will give me a new torus, but a torus which the conformal field theory will not recognize as being different. It will recognize that new torus as being the same as the old one. In that case, this uh, transformation is a symmetry of the partition function. And that's precisely the modular group. So the thrilling part of this is that the, the question which a physicist would ask, what are the symmetries of this torus that a CFT uh, perceives, uh, is answered by a mathematics problem, which is classify all conformal structures on the torus. The classification of conformal structures is that they are given by all possible uh, vectors tau in the upper half plane, modulo the uh, modular group PSL to Z. So it's the same statement. In principle, one can spend much more time and it's a, I admit it's a very difficult, um, it's a very difficult thing to grasp fully at the on the first hearing, but it's worth learning because it underlies the structure of 2D CFT in a very deep way. And it also turns out to have some echoes in other dimensional CFTs. Was that okay, Daniel? Yeah, yeah, it was great. Yeah, there are other other questions in the chat. Maybe I read for you. Please, it yeah. says the Cadmody algebra has application in construction of integrable hierarchies in integrable systems. Are some relations between conformal theories and integrable systems? Thank you. Yes, there are in fact very deep relations between conformal theories and integrable systems, uh, and one can think of it in two ways. One is of course. Uh, an integrable system is one with an infinite number of conservation laws. And I've just shown you that a conformal field theory has infinitely many conserved currents. So already it's a type of integrable system. And in fact, it's not just integrable, but solvable. Now, there's something more than that, which is that I can deform a conformal field theory by adding some relevant operator. If I add to the Hamiltonian some operator which is relevant in the sense of renormalization group, which means it has a low enough dimension, then it will uh, make the CFT, which was a fixed point of RG flow, it will make it flow again. And this flow is downward in central charge until it reaches some other fixed point. And that other fixed point may be another conformal field theory, but it can also happen that a conformal field theory flows till it reaches a fixed point, uh, which has a, a different nature, which is massive, okay? A massive fixed point is what we call a gapped system. So as a CFT, it's trivial, but it's a very interesting quantum field theory. 
and uh, typically you get things like TODA systems and so on. And those are precisely integrable models of the kind people like to study uh, and which uh, satisfy integrable hierarchy, integral, integrable hierarchies. So uh, it means that conformal field theories when deformed lead to some of these integrable massive systems and uh, where these hierarchies like KP hierarchy and so on are applicable, KDV, KP and so on. So there's a very intimate connection between Katz-Moody algebras uh, in conformal field theory and Katz-Moody algebras in these other integrable systems. So they, they are actually related. Okay, now let me tell you some basic facts about uh, classification of 2D CFT as it was understood um, in about four decades ago, uh, starting with some very classic work of Belavin, Polyakov, and Zamolodchikov, and also of Knizhnik and Zamolodchikov. So uh, these groups uh, described infinite families of two dimensional CFTs based on specific symmetry algebras. In particular, they said, well, let's classify all representations of just the Vera Soro algebra, which have finitely many primaries and central charge less than one. And they found that once you put the restriction of central charge less than one, then there's a unique infinite family of CFTs with this family of central charges. These are called the Vera Soro minimal models. And if you evaluate this for m equals 3, 4, and 5, you'll get the numbers I showed you earlier 1 by 2 for the easing model, 7 by 10 for the tricritical easing, and 4 by 5 for the POTS model. Okay, so the first three models in this series are three physics models that are very well known and very, very much liked because they're quite simple. So now what they found was that um, these are the central charges and they could also find the allowed spectrum of dimensions of the primary field. So there's a formula for that, which I haven't written down. However, uh, given the representation, you can have more than one modular invariant partition function. And that's a very subtle issue um, and which I won't really address directly in this talk. But it was an important follow-up to that work to completely classify all CFTs with central charge less than one. And this was done in 1987 in a very classic work of these authors. Now, this was basically, um, so this was the, for the Virasoro minimal models. Uh, and uh, this was the paper of BPZ of 1984. If you look at the paper of Knishnik and Zamilor-Chikov, they simply did the same thing, but for Katz-Moody algebras, which gives a somewhat richer structure, because now the central charge is not restricted to be less than one. It can be much larger than one. But the question is, what are the representations with finitely many primaries? And this has been classified. And it turns out that whenever you do this, you find a theory with the central charge which is completely determined by properties of the group, the Lie group associated to the Katz-Moody algebra of A, B, C, D, E, F, G type, its dimension. Uh, K is the level of the Katz-Moody algebra. G is the dual Coxeter number of the finite algebra. So all these quantities are known. So basically this is saying that once you know K, you have determined C. You can see from this formula that when K becomes very large, then C becomes equal to the dimension of the group. And this is somehow the statement that C is counting the degrees of freedom, because when I have a Lie group, then the dimension of the group manifold is a measure of how many degrees of freedom there are in the system. But when K is very small, it doesn't actually measure the dimension. It actually measures something closer to the rank. And that's a very beautiful property. So we should not think that C is very literally a measure of dimension. Uh, but in some limits, it behaves like that. Okay. However, here the classification of modular invariant partition functions is not complete. So Capelli, Sixen, and Zuber, who I listed on the previous slide, uh, did consider some special cases uh, like uh, A1, that is SU2 at level K, uh, and people have done SU3, people have done some 
thing for uh, higher cases, but it's not classified yet. So this remains an open problem for generically algebras. Now, once uh, these two seminal papers came out, then other groups uh, working associated with these people, again, many of them from the Landau Institute in the then Soviet Union, uh, considered higher spin algebras with names like W3, W4, and so on, and worked out their representations. So quite a lot got known, uh, and it got known by asking the following question. Supposing I assume a particular algebra, then what are the uh, representations that are allowed, um, or so-called the minimal series that are allowed uh, for those symmetries? So that's something that most people think is somehow sort of classification of CFT. But as I'll argue in the rest of my talk, it's very, very incomplete and misleading to think that this amounts to a classification of 2D CFT. Still, let me tell you another fact about this 1980s period, and then I'll, I'll be able to move on to more contemporary results. So Goddard, Kent, and Olive in the 1980s uh, proposed something called a coset construction. If you see, this came very quickly after the papers I've just reviewed. And their idea was very nice. They said, well, supposing I have two conformal field theories, CFT1 and CFT2, and their chiral algebras are V1 and V2. And supposing V2 is a subalgebra of V1. Subalgebra has a well-defined meaning. You have an algebra which has generators and commutator relations. A subalgebra is a subset of those generators with the same commutation relations. Okay. So if V2 is a subalgebra of V1, then there's a way to construct a theory called the coset of CFT1 over CFT2. And it gives rise to a new CFT, which is neither CFT1 nor CFT2, but a new one entirely called CFT coset with the central charge being the difference between C1 and C2. And this led to a whole new set of theories and even new ways of writing old theories. So one of the classic results that's very widely quoted is that if we understand the coset construction, even the Virasoro minimal models uh, become something we can derive from the Katz-Moody or vesumino witten models. So if I take the coset given on the right side of this equation, it's easy to show that it's precisely the mth virus or a minimal model where m is k plus two. So the coset construction is very deep. If you can, whenever you can find a CFT and another which is its, uh, which whose chiral algebra is a proper subalgebra. Okay, so if you ask people, maybe not people who work in specifically in 2D CFT, but even some people who do, that what do we know about classifying 2D CFT? They would probably say something like, well, we classify chiral algebras and take their cosets and that's everything. At least that's everything with a finite number of primaries. And this statement is first of all, um, not obviously true, but secondly, it's not also obviously useful. And I'll try to explain both these facts soon. Now, another set of papers from the late 80s proposed that if we classify all consistent braidings and fusings of conformal blocks, that would classify all rational CFTs. And braidings and fusings, by the way, includes also modular transformations of characters. That's called modular data. So they said this is a set of data which tells you the multivaluedness of conformal blocks and the multivaluedness of characters. If we can classify all such allowed multivaluednesses, then we would have classified all RCFT. And unfortunately, this is also not the case. In fact, we know many different RCFT which have the precise same braidings and fusings as each other. And it's very difficult to know among that family which are genuine CFTs and which are not. And I'll show you that in some examples. In fact, what we understand today is that the moore cyber criteria classify what is called the topological data of CFT. And this has actually led to the development of an entirely new field, topological field theory, TQFT, 
and it's closely related, as you might guess, to Chern Simon's theory. But it only captures topological data, and we know now that for any given set of data, there can be many CFTs. So this is also not a classification. And in fact, uh, what I'm going to show you now uh, is that even if we consider the most trivial possibility, namely CFTs that have just one primary field, which is the identity. So all the states in the theory are descendants of the identity under some chiral algebra. These are called meromorphic CFT, and it's not a simple problem to classify them. However, it's a problem that mathematicians find extremely interesting, and I'm going to go into that problem now. So this is the end of my third section. Are there any questions at this stage? If there's anything I can explain in more detail, I'll be happy to do so. Just tell me. Everyone is silent. Um, well, I have a I have a little question about. I thought the introduction of the Cosette model was by Kasama Suzuki. Uh, Kasama, no. Suzuki model. Kasama Suzuki came actually much later. Uh, in fact, Kasama Suzuki, I'll tell you what they did. Uh, their goal was to construct not just CFT, but n equals two super conformal CFT. And not just n equals one, but n equals two. And they cleverly used the coset construction that I've just described for you by Goddard, Kent, and Olive, uh, along with some data of super conformal symmetry to give a construction method for super conformal CFT. Okay. So Kazama Suzuki came much later, I think in the late 80s, some years after Goddard, Kent, and Olive, and it made use of Goddard, Kent, and Olive's construction, but in the context of super conformal theories, which, as I said, we are not studying today. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? Okay. In that case, I'll go on and tell you something about meromorphic CFT. So it's it should be the simplest problem, right? After all that I've told you, classify all CFTs which have only one primary and every other state or field of the theory is a descendant. Now, from what I told you, the partition function is normally the sum of mod squares of characters with the sum being carried out over primaries. But there's only one primary, so there's only one term in the sum. And so Z itself is the mod squared of a single holomorphic function. And now the multivaluedness of this function can't be very much. Earlier, there was a possibility that under modular transformations, it goes into linear combinations. But it can't do that now because there's nothing to take a linear combination of. The best that can happen is under modular transformations, Chi picks up a phase. That's the only possibility. So everything looks much, much simpler. Good. Now, fortunately, the question of having analytic functions of tau, which are modular invariant up to a phase, was solved by mathematicians uh, more than a century ago. The statement is that if uh, chi has to be modular invariant up to a phase, then it must be a particular type of function of a particular modular invariant called the J invariant. The J invariant is defined abstractly and you can define it in terms of theta functions, but you can also look at its uh, series expansion and its series expansion is Q to the minus one plus a constant plus some definite integers times Q, Q squared and so on. And if you understand this as an analytic function and perform a modular transformation, tau goes to a tau plus b, over C tau plus D, you find that J simply comes back to itself and is the unique function which does that, okay, with suitable behavior at infinity uh, and no poles anywhere in tau space. And so this is, in some sense, the problem of finding chi's is solved. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you could, uh, of course, take any function of J, like powers of J, but it turns out you can also take fractional powers of J, but only one third powers. 
And the reason is that if you take any other powers, then you spoil its analyticity property. This has some this has some deep mathematics behind it, which I could explain, but I shouldn't for lack of time. And so the most general character, chi, has to be j to some one third fraction. So I've written j to the alpha by three, where alpha is zero, one, or two. And once we fix that fraction, then all the remaining terms are integral powers of j. So it's a polynomial in j. This is meant to be a finite sum over n going up to some finite value. It's easy to read off the central charge of such a character because it's basically the highest power of j. We realize that j starts with q to the minus one. So the highest power of j uh, is q to the minus some number n max plus alpha by three. And that number must be equal to c by 24. From that we get c. So there are some examples, and if you've studied any string theory at all, some of these examples will be familiar. So first of all, taking one third powers of J, I can only generate multiples of eight, central charge multiples of eight. At central charge eight, the only possible modulo invariant character is J to the one third. And uh, it's known that J to the one third is the Katsmudi character of E8 at level one. I should have written level one here. And that's the only possibility. E8 is, as you might know, is the highest of the set of exceptional Lie algebras, G2, F4, E6, E7, E8. At C equals 16, the only possible character is J to the two third, but now it can actually correspond to two different Lie algebras, E8 cross E8, and a particular version of D16, which is the same as SO32. And it's precisely because of these existence of these two unique solutions that we could make in 1980s, the heterotic string whose gauge group is E8 cross E8 or D16 plus. So this is an example where the CFT was used as the world sheet of a string. And actually the only the left moving or right moving part of that world sheet uh, making a heterotic string. I'm really not sure how many people in this audience have seen the heterotic string, but it's something that sooner or later you're going to encounter if you study string theory at all. Yeah, actually, there was a talk, a full heterotic string theory by um, a Ana Maria Font. Okay, good. I don't know if it's the same people who attend to that talk. Yeah, that's yeah the, some yeah. of them are familiar. Good. But uh, now I suspect that you may not have ever heard it before stated in this language that it's basically the reason why there are two possible heterotic strings in 10 dimensions is comes from the fact that there are two meromorphic CFTs at central charge 16, which is the difference between 26 and 10. Okay, now you think, okay, this is very easy at eight and 16, the problem is well solved. What about 24? Well, 24 is a very interesting case because here the power of J is one. And when I have J to the one, I can add uh, any constant I like. So this curly N is an integer and I can just add it because an integer is modular invariant. I couldn't add it in the previous two cases because these previous cases pick up a phase under modular transformations and an integer obviously cannot pick up a phase. So I can add it only to uh, linear terms in J. So J plus N is allowed as a modular invariant character. And N seems to be, it seems to be possible that N could be just any integer, at least any positive integer, even maybe a few negative integers. In fact, if you look at the form of J on this slide, you see that N will change the value of 744 to 744 plus N because I'm adding a constant to this. Okay, so as long as n doesn't go below minus 744, this will have all uh, positive integers or non-negative integer coefficients, and then it is a possible character of a CFT. But here we encounter for the first time that, well, but this is not a CFT. For every n, we don't have a CFT. There are special values of n at which we find CFTs, and I'll talk more about this on the next page. So there are certain constructions of examples for fixed values of n, 
maybe I shouldn't go into this lattice business in any detail now for lack of time, but this has to do with the very beautiful mathematics of even self-dual lattices or even unimodular lattices. And similarly, at C equals 32, these are possible characters I can write down, and this is how it goes. So the problem of writing down possible characters is very easy to solve in this meromorphic case. And this is the recipe of how we see uh, when these correspond to uh, CFTs. But uh, as I said, I'm not going to go into that in some detail. It has to do with free bosons compactified on a C-dimensional torus. However, something interesting happens once we cross C equals 24, and I'll say more about that on the next slide. So I'm coming back to this most general admissible character at C equals 24, which is J plus N. So N can be any integer greater than or equal to minus 744, which is an infinite set of possibilities. But in a very, very influential work in 1992, uh, Bert Schellikens uh, proved that there are only 71 possible CFTs. And that also doesn't mean that there are 71 values of N. There are actually less values of N. And for some of them, there are multiple CFTs. But for most values of N, there's simply no CFT. So let's see how his construction worked. <laughs> okay, 24 of these uh, are obtained by taking 24, I'm sorry, there are too many 24s in this problem. We are at C equals 24, and it happens that there are 24 Nehemiah lattices in that dimension. These, it's some sort of coincidence, okay? But in each of those 24 lattices, we take a lattice, which is basically a structure, periodic structure in 24 dimensions, and we compactify a set of that many free bosons, 24, on that lattice. And if the lattice is both even, which means the length of all vectors squared is even, and also unimodular, which means the volume of a basic cell is one, then it turns out that the uh, character is modular invariant and therefore has must have the form J plus N. But if we can find free bosons on a lattice, then we found a CFT, not just a possible character. So Shelikin started his work by saying, well, there are 24 lattice theories that are modular invariant and they definitely exist as conformal field theories because I can write their Lagrangian. And then he said, well, if I have a theory, I can maybe take some orbifold of the lattice. And if I'm careful in how I take it, I can get some more theories. And he wrote those down also. And here's one example. So Shelkins' paper has a list of 71 CFTs. This is the 59th in his list. The table is at the end of his paper. And I'd like to go through this in a little detail to explain how it works. So what we do is we take the Katz-Moody algebra A11 at level 1. We tensor it with D7 at level 1 and E6 at level 1, all of them. Now, if you... Uh, count the total rank of this group or algebra, it's 11 plus 7 plus 6, that is 24. And all of them are at level 1. And this is, and all of them are simply laced algebras. So A, D, and E are the simply laced algebras, while B, C, F, and G are the uh, doubly or triply laced algebras. Okay. So now it turns out from lattice, from the theory of lattices, of even self dual lattices, that such a combination can be realized as the root system of a lattice. The root system is a, the special set of points that defines the basic cell of the lattice in terms of which we get the whole lattice. Okay, now uh, this is one example of a Shellikens theory and here is another one. This one, if you see, has D7 but at Katzmudi level 3 and it also has a non-simply laced algebra G2. And this is a signal that it describes a non-lattice theory. What is beautiful is that in each of these cases, if we just wrote down the vesumino witten model for A11, D7, and E6, we'd get some conformal field theory with many hundred uh, primary fields. Complicated, but very well understood. Not interesting. We are not interested in theory things with hundreds of primary fields. But what one can show is that 
there's a particular modulo invariant combination of all the characters, which is a single one. So there's a single modulo invariant you can take by performing a linear combination over all the characters. And the result gives you a meromorphic CFT with just one primary. So uh, a message you can take away from this is that out of a very complicated theory, which is easy to define, you end up with a very simple theory, which is difficult to define. Because to define the simple theory of Shelikens, I have to tell you how to extract from this katz moody algebra some modular invariant. And that's a procedure. It's well known. It's quite well understood. Uh, but it's hard to write down. It's already tricky for the lattice theories. But luckily there we can lean on mathematicians who have classified lattices. But it's really difficult for non-lattice theories. Okay. Because there you have to use a lot of physics intuition and trace identities, anomalies. So a whole lot of understanding of the heterotic string actually was plugged back into conformal field theory to make Schellekens list complete. Okay. So at this point, I realize I've touched on some of the most difficult things in this field. But I want to emphasize this is a sign of how difficult it is to classify 2D CFT because this is the difficulty of classifying those with one primary field. Now imagine the difficulty of classifying those with two, three, four primary fields. It goes up. Okay. So that's what the problem is like. And it's quite amazing that Shelikens could do this in 92. Uh, for the next 30 years, mathematicians have worked on his paper, made it rigorous, and they have inevitably found that basically all his conclusions were correct. There wasn't a single error found, uh, but they made his proofs more rigorous. His proofs were given in physics language and they gave more rigorous proofs in maths language. Okay. So now it's an interesting fact that out of his 71 theories, 70 look like this. They are meromorphic extensions of non-simple katz moody algebras. Namely, they are uh, non-simple katz moody algebras of the kind I showed you, where there's a miraculous modular invariant. But the 71st theory plays a very important role in mathematics. It has no katz moody algebra at all. So it has a chiral algebra, but that chiral algebra doesn't include any katz moody algebra. It includes the Virasoro algebra, and it includes something called the Grice algebra, uh, which is something invented by the mathematician Grice or discovered. And that particular theory is known as the monster module, and it contains information about the irreducible representations of the largest sporadic discrete group uh, possible, which is called the monster group. It's a group uh, whose order is a few billion, 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 or something like that. And uh, it, it's a discrete group, which is not part of any standard series like cyclic or permutation or any of those discrete groups. And it's a mystery that mathematicians actually were able to finally tackle using methods of conformal field theory. Now, this is the story at central charge 24, but at central charge 32, it turns out that there are just too many. So Shelikens found 71 theories, 71 is a small number, we are good. But at central charge 32, there are at least, uh, what is this number, a billion, even unimodular lattices. So that's already that many meromorphic CFTs and an unknown number of non-lattice theories. So complete classification of CFT, meromorphic CFT, starts to be impossible from central charge 32. Okay. And with this, I think I've given you one of the most useful pieces of information in where we stand in classifying conformal field theories. Now, in the last part of the talk, and I'm going to shorten it a bit because I sense that we are uh, already at one hour and 20, one and a half hours, no, one hour and 20 minutes. So I'd like to talk only 15 minutes more. In the last part, I'm going to talk about the problem of CFT classification when there are two or more primary fields or two or more independent characters. Okay. And this is based on work that I uh, initiated along with collaborators in the 1980s and which I've been pursuing now in the last seven or eight years very actively. And again, developments have merged in our direction from mathematics. So now the problem has become very popular in the mathematics community. 
So this is another good time to pause for questions. I recognize this is difficult stuff, but if there's anything that you'd like to ask, which you think might help me simplify it, please do ask. Okay, then let's move on. Now, <clears throat> in 1988, Shelikens' paper had not been written. So we didn't actually know anything about the classification of meromorphic CFT, and we weren't very interested in it either, because we naively thought that they are very simple. What could be more simple than just having one or two primary fields? One primary field, sorry. So we thought the interesting CFTs are those with two or more primaries. And in a way, we were right. But what are two or more primaries? That means one of the primaries is always the vacuum or the identity. And there's at least one more. Okay, And we started with exactly two. So we thought, well, how can you classify characters that are admissible, that have the right modular properties uh, for such systems? And we proposed a technique based on modular linear differential equations that I'll very briefly explain to you and show you the consequences. So first, let me tell you the results. So this is a technique to generate all possible functions, chi i, which have this form for some dimensions h i and some degeneracies a i 0, a i 1, a i 2, etc which are all non-negative, such that the set chi i under modular transformations transforms it to itself by a suitable matrix row. Okay, so this is a purely mathematics problem, if you like, and it had not been addressed in the mathematics literature, and we happened to stumble upon a very nice uh, intuitive solution, which actually quickly made contact with other approaches to CFT. So this work was done in collaboration with Samir Mathur and Ashok Sen at Tata Institute in 1988 and 89. Now, this technique only gives you admissible characters. And these are things that could be characters of a CFT, but as we have learned, they need not always. And so there's a next step to determine whether they really correspond to a CFT. And that next step, uh, I'll come to as I go along. The basic idea is to rely on this analytic and multi-valued nature of characters, which I've emphasized repeatedly before. There, there are n characters where n is roughly the number of primary fields, but they transform into each other under modular transformations. And what we thought is, Supposing we have a differential equation of which these are the n independent solutions, then it's well known that when a differential equation is invariant under some symmetries, the solutions can permute into each other under the same symmetry. And in fact, it turns out there's a theorem in the theory of differential equations, which says this is always possible, that if I was given some n objects that transform under a symmetry, I can always find a differential equation of which these are precisely the n independent solutions. It's a linear nth order differential equation. But the beauty is that the differential equation, unlike the solutions, would be analytic and modular invariant. And please note that until now in my talk, I have not discussed situations which were both analytic and modular invariant. Our objects were either modular invariant, but not analytic, or they were analytic, but not modular invariant. And the differential equation is the object, which is both. And uh, I'll be concrete and I'll only consider n equals two second order equations. We won't talk about higher order equations at all. So if n is two, the most general second order modular invariant differential equation I can write, is done by defining a covariant derivative d, which takes the characters chi, which transform nicely under modular transformations, and maps them onto something which still transforms nicely. So it, this extra term k by 12 e2 is something like the affine connection in gravity. It makes d by d tau into a covariant derivative. 
We don't need the details for this talk. The important thing is that it adds a modular weight of two to anything it acts on. So d squared on chi has a modular weight of four. So if I want the equation to be modular invariant, this has modular weight two, this d, the middle term. So it must be multiplied by a modular form of weight two. And the last term has to also have a weight of four. Then all three terms in the equation have a weight four. And under modular transformation, that weight comes outside and the equation is invariant. So this is a kind of differential equation that we propose to study. Now, um, one way to illuminate it is to actually give you the proof of the theorem, which says that supposing I have two characters, chi zero and chi one, which form a VVMF, a vector valued modular form that goes into itself under modular transformations, then it's a trivial statement that the following determinant must be zero if and only if chi in the last column is a linear combination of chi zero and chi one. Okay, because if chi is a linear combination, then obviously the last column is a linear combination of the first two columns and this is zero and the converse is also true. But now I expand this by the last column and I get this equation and you recognize that this is my differential equation for chi. With fixed coefficient functions, fixed by knowing the solutions. Okay, of course, we don't know the solutions. If we knew the solutions, we didn't need to write the equation, but we know the properties of the solutions. And that's all we'll need. So now if I divide throughout by the first determinant in this equation, I find that my phi two and phi four are these ratios of determinants. Uh, the determinants are called Ronskian determinants. And this is the Ronskian method of finding a differential equation given a set of solutions. Okay, so the notice that from this that phi two and phi four can both have poles whenever the denominator has zeros. Okay, and this is very important because um, chi's are actually holomorphic or analytic, so chi's cannot have poles, but ratios of determinants certainly can have poles because the denominator can have zeros. And it's a theorem in the theory of modular forms that the number of such poles uh, is a multiple of one sixth. It's not integral because the uh, moduli space, the space on which tau takes values, has some cusps, like some orbifold points. And because of those orbifold points, the number of possible poles is a multiple of one sixth. So it can be fractional. And okay, I won't go into this, but the important thing is that there's an integer here called L, which is the Ronskian index. And our classification proceeded by uh, fixing the Ronskian index and trying to write the differential equation. Turns out for two, for second order equations, it's also uh, known that this is even. So zero, two, four, six, like that. And the beauty is that for any given L, there's a finite basis of functions of E4 and E6 to Eisenstein series, which generate all possible modular forms from which phi2 and phi4 are built. So the differential equation has a finite number of parameters that grows with L. And uh, now we fix L to various small values, starting with zero and scan the finite parameter space of the differential equation to look for solutions that are admissible. And if you think about it in the modern context, you've probably heard of conformal bootstrap. Well, this is an example of doing conformal bootstrap because what we are doing is varying some parameter and for generic values, the characters don't look admissible at all, but for special values, they do. Okay. So let's do one example and then I'll actually stop and just tell you what the results are. Supposing the Ronskian index is zero, well, there's no modular form which is completely analytic and of weight two, so phi two has to be zero. And there's only one modular form of weight four, which is analytic, that's the Eisenstein series E4. And mu is an arbitrary parameter and this leads to the differential equation d squared plus mu E4 on chi is zero. Now note that we know everything in this differential equation except the value of mu. The equation will have solutions for any mu, but the solutions are not going to look like characters of CFT except for special values of mu. And I'll show you examples to, um, to, 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 to illustrate that. 
Okay. But the important thing is just knowing one real number mu, I know the entire character, the entire two solutions of this equation are completely determined in terms of one real parameter. Okay. Uh, so, okay, I'm not going to go into this, but I'll show you two examples. So, if mu happens to take this value, which minus 119 by 3600, which we found by scanning appropriately, it's easier than it sounds. Then you get the solutions chi 0 and chi 1 looking like this. Now, notice that chi 0 has completely integral coefficients all the way. And if you compute 5000 terms, it continues to be integer. Chi 1, on the other hand, has 34 by 7 in the second term. So it's not all integer. But I could multiply chi 1 by 7. Remember, this is a homogeneous linear differential equation. So I can change the normalization if I want. And if I multiply throughout by 7, the second expression, it starts with 7. And the next term is 34. And then, of course, all other terms are integral. Okay. And once I do that, then this pair is an admissible pair of characters. And we find that it's readily identified with the Vesumino Witten model based on G2 at level 1. So without knowing any Lie algebra theory, we found the characters of that model. Yes. Come on. OK. On the other hand, if I took a different value of mu, just very close to the previous one, I would get this kind of solution. And you can see in this solution that there's nothing integral about the coefficients. There's no way to think of them as integers. And there's no way to normalize them to be integers because every successive term has a higher denominator. So clearly, this cannot be a CFT. Okay, And this is the bootstrap method, which picked out from among the space of solutions of one differential equation, a small number of admissible solutions. And this is our table from um, uh, 1988, showing all the possible solutions. And you see that we found a very interesting series of vesumino witten models by doing this bootstrap. And it turned out that this is a complete classification of two character CFTs with Ronskin index zero only. That still leaves two, four, six up to infinity. And um, the rest of it is a, still a long story, and I don't think I have time to go into it. So I want to conclude now by uh, summarizing some of the properties of these solutions. So I think that's the main thing I can tell you. So let me conclude with a few properties of solutions of these differential equations. First of all, the order of the differential equation technically doesn't give the number of primaries, but the number of characters. How is it possible these two things are different? Well, consider a vesumino witten model based on SUN. The representation N and N bar of SUN have the same group theory. So they have the same character. Okay, but n and n bar are two distinct fields. It's like having a complex field and it's complex conjugate like quarks and antiquarks. Okay, so in this case, for SU3, for example, we have a second order equation, but we really have three primaries, two characters, but three primaries. That's one feature. Okay, cosets, I think I can't go into because I don't have time. Uh, but I also want to say that if we restrict to the case of two primaries rather than two characters, then we can completely classify all CFTs with central charge 20, less than 25. This is something I did with Brandon and Rehon last year. And I'm extremely proud of this work because it's one of the very few, in fact, I think the only complete classification of rational CFTs beyond Shelikens in a range of central charges. Okay, in a significant range of central charges. And again, I'll skip the method and I'll just flash for you the fact that there are 123 such theories. In You can compare with Shelikens' 71 theories. And yes, I know this is a difficult slide to read, but here's a close-up. So basically, all of these arise using the coset construction, starting with the Shelikens theory, which is called S of something, and dividing by a certain... Uh, two character CFT, and we proved that this is complete and this generates all possible uh, two primary CFTs with central charge less than 25. At this point, it does look like a very, very mathematical result, and it is. And in fact, this paper is published in Communications of Mathematical Physics, but um, 
we should remember this is a classification in principle of all possible critical phenomena with these properties that they have precisely two primaries and uh, their central charge is less than 25. This is all possible phenomena. There cannot be any other phenomena within the axioms of conformal field theory. So with this, I think I can just, uh, I, now there's, I had a section beyond two characters. It just uh, is another list of classifications. It's much more difficult. Three characters is already very difficult, uh, but there are lots of new things that we've been able to do and you can look at the papers. So in conclusion, I should say the modular differential equation approach has proved itself over three and a half decades in finding admissible sets of characters that could be CFT. Uh, however, in general, admissible characters do not lead to CFT and identifying CFT among them relies largely on using the coset construction. Uh, I mentioned the coset construction, but I didn't have time to show you how we used it here. However, both the coset construction and the modular differential equation are topics of considerable interest to mathematicians uh, who are still working on the classification of meromorphic CFT. Uh, and because of that, uh, it seems that the next decade or two will see a lot of progress in the classification of 2D CFT. So with that, I'll stop and I'll say thank you. And I'm happy to answer questions.